want you to imagine what it's like to watch these elevator doors open. But when you try to move, your feet feel like they're glued to the floor. And no matter how much you will them, you can't take a step before the doors close in front of you. I want you to imagine what it's like to see your favorite chair in your living room. But you can no longer sit there because you can't generate enough strength and momentum to stand from it. I want you to imagine what it's like to watch the crosswalk signal count down, knowing full well that you can't walk fast enough across the street before the cars start honking. I want you to imagine what it's like to have so much tremor in your hands that you can no longer button your shirt or tie your shoes. Things you've done since you were four years old. What I just described to you is what it's like for over 1.5 million Americans suffering from Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurologic disease that affects our ability to control our movements. In persons with Parkinson's disease, specific areas of the brain undergo a rapid cell death, leading to the depletion of an important chemical messenger that you've heard about, dopamine. We don't know why these cells start rapidly dying, and there is no cure. By the year 2030, the worldwide population of Parkinson's patients will more than double to well over 9 million people. But it's not just these 9 million people that are affected, because these patients have spouses, they have parents and children, they have coworkers, close friends, and maybe even some frenemies that are now all impacted by the disease. To bring it closer to home for the audience, each one of you is experiencing a slow cell death in these same areas of the brain. So if your cardiologist and our general practitioners do their jobs and we all live long enough, we may experience some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. You can see the symptoms here hopefully in this video, and you can see the shaking in his hands, you can see the slowness and the rigidity in his movements, you can see the difficulty with walking, the difficulty with balance. And while the majority of these symptoms are caused by the depletion of that one simple messenger, you would think that this treatment of this disease would be easy. But it's not. Right? We should just say, missing drug, give drug, and we're done but it's much more complicated than that. Our first line of defense is prescription drugs, and we're trying to replace that missing dopamine. And so you can see in this patient video, her movements are slow and small and rigid. Then after she takes her medication, about 45 minutes later, you'll see that her movements become bigger and faster, and her whole overall approach seems more energized. But as the voiceovers and our television commercials and the fine print and our magazine ads remind us, prescription drugs are not without their side effects. And some of these side effects are simply annoying. But some of these side effects can completely alter our patient's quality of life. So you see, I must remind you that Parkinson's disease is a progressive condition. So over time, the symptoms will get worse. And as the symptoms get worse, it becomes more and more challenging to treat it with pharmacological treatments. So the complexities of the treatment becomes much larger. With this difficulty, we see an increased chance of side effects. And so these abnormal movements you're seeing in this patient, these abnormal movements are not caused by her Parkinson's disease. These abnormal movements are caused by her treatment of her Parkinson's disease. For these patients, one option is brain surgery. In a deep brain stimulation surgery, the neurosurgeon inserts an electrode into the center of your brain and delivers electricity in an attempt to overpower misbehaving brain cells. In deep brain stimulation surgery, is very effective 
at removing these abnormal movements. But as you can imagine, brain surgery in an older adult population is not without the risk for complications. Also, you can imagine the delivery of energy into your brain from a battery pack in your chest might lead to some unwanted side effects. Now, I want to be clear. We are blessed to have these drugs and these surgeries because they can make an important impact on many of the symptoms of this disease. Tremor, rigidity, even some slowness of movement. But there's one symptom that these are not overly effective at treating, and that's our patient's mobility. We define mobility as the ability of our patients to move in and around their environment. Okay? How do they climb stairs? How do they get out of chairs? How do they walk through the grocery store? Even in the best medicated state, our patients still move about 25% slower than healthy older adults. So there's a reason this gentleman's unhappy. He's unhappy because his mobility impairment affects his quality of life. He's unhappy because how he judges whether his Parkinson treatments are working or how they improve his mobility. The singer-songwriter Ed Sheeran is so eloquently asked, did you think the science guy was gonna sing? <laughs> like we've had like professional singers out here, so. When your legs don't work like they used to before and I can't sweep you off of your feet, will your mouth still remember the taste of my love? Will your eyes still smile from your cheeks? When you look at the interaction of our patients and their spouses, and you saw that today, with the Whitmores, the answer to that question becomes self-evident. And it's my life's work to honor this love and commitment and to make sure that first part of the verse never has to be said. A patient is defined in the dictionary as somebody who receives medical treatment. A wise friend once told me that she doesn't want to be a patient. She's not a person with Parkinson's disease because she chooses who she wants to be with. She did not choose to be with Parkinson's disease. She wants to be a participant in the fight against Parkinson's disease. And the mission of our laboratory is to empower our patients to become participants in the fight to regain their mobility. So if we're gonna do that, if we're gonna empower our patients to become participants to improve their mobility, we have to understand what their mobility impairment is. So we bring patients into the laboratory and we have them do things like walk up and down stairs. We have them step over obstacles. We have them get out of chairs. And while these everyday tasks seem simple, they're actually not as simple as you might think. So the task of getting out of a chair, you actually have to generate significant momentum from your trunk in the forward direction. And as you do that, that's gonna get your bum off the chair. But then you have to transfer that momentum in the vertical direction. At the same time, you take one foot off the ground. When we are one foot off the ground, that's a time when we can lose our balance. So something even very simple that we do every day is actually quite complex. So we brought patients into the lab and we tested them. We said, well, what are their impairments that are, that are really causing their mobility issues? And one of the first things we noticed is that our patients would appear to be green and white and see-through. <laughs> Odd. <laughs> and then after that, we realized that they're weaker in many of the muscles of the lower extremity. And their brain has reorganized how it uses those muscles to do the same task that we do every day. So we want to empower our patients to improve these things. We thought we'd start with the only intervention known to man to have no negative side effects, and that's exercise. So in a series of studies, we brought patients into the laboratory and we had them lift weights. We focused on generating strength and power in the lower extremity. And we hope that in addition to making them perhaps bigger and stronger and better looking in a swimsuit, we might also influence how they do things. And so this simulation that you'll see, the blue simulation is the patient prior to beginning the exercise intervention, and the green simulation is after the intervention. 
And so what you can see is that after intervention, the patient generates more forward momentum and they actually start stepping much earlier. So we've changed the way they do the task. And the task they do it now is much like healthy older adults. Another major problem in Parkinson's disease patients is heart disease. Okay, it's one of the main causes of death in this patient population, much like it is in our older adults. And we also see changes in cognition. And so we looked at what interventions might improve that, and we looked at first aerobic exercise. And so we had patients come into the laboratory, we had them ride exercise bikes, and we had them walk on treadmills. And we found that after the intervention, they could do complex thinking tasks much better. But it'd also be nice if they could transfer over into improving their motor impairments. So the video I'm showing you is from a collaboration with my colleagues at the Cleveland Clinic. This is a patient who's trying to take the, the stylus to the computer and draw a straight line. But you could see he couldn't even do the task because his tremor was so large. This is the same patient after an aerobic bout of exercise. The tremor is almost completely gone. Okay, when he raises his arms, his arms are as steady or as you as an eye. So just by being more active, we can perhaps empower our patients to improve their mobility. But truthfully, we all know we should exercise, right? And not many people do it to the level to which we should to get all the benefits. So we have to come up with ways that we can empower our patients in the immediacy. So we go back to our elevator example, right? When the elevator doors open, we want to walk through them. So how do we actually do that? When the elevator doors open and we're standing here with our feet side by side, the first thing that happens is a weight shift. Okay? You shift your weight from this leg to this leg and back so that I can take a step. And that weight shift allows me to, gener to start generating momentum so that I can take steps. And in our Parkinson's patients, what we found is that they have an ineffective weight shift. Okay? And so the weight shift leads to a reduction in how big their steps are and how fast their steps are. So we thought, well, what can we do to improve this? And as we know in life, sometimes the best ideas are the simplest ideas. So what if instead of standing like this, I just simply moved my feet so that I started walking with my foot a half a step length back? So just something simple from here to here. And what we found is that eliminates the need for that weight shift. And so when our patients start in this position, they take bigger and faster steps. And for healthy older adults in the audience, if you start in this position, you'll take bigger and faster steps, even more so than college students. So something pretty simple can have a pretty big impact. This is video is what it's like for our patient to walk across the street at lunchtime. So you can see the people brushing by him. You can see the cars driving by. Watch out for the scooter. And as he gets closer, he can clearly see that the crosswalk signal is counting down. Cars start giving him unwanted attention. And as you can imagine, this can be a very stressful time for this person. Right? It can, it can create an emotional response. And so we asked ourselves, can we use emotion to influence behavior? Well, does emotion influence behavior? So we Googled it. <laughs> and, and horror movies come up. So what happens in a horror movie? Right? You're being chased by an ax murderer. You fall down. If you're being chased by a zombie, you can't get your keys in the car. So clearly, negative emotions can influence our behaviors. So what about other emotions? And so we thought, well, maybe we can use pictures to elicit an emotion. And as Max showed us, we can use pictures to elicit an emotion. So we brought patients into the lab, and we showed them pictures on a screen. We showed them happy pictures and sad pictures and scary pictures and disgusting pictures. I didn't like that part. And then we had them walk. And what we found is when we show them happy pictures, they took bigger and faster steps. 
which is great if we can carry a giant screen like this to every crosswalk that we might ever have to walk across. So we had to think of other ways. So we said, what if we just thought about happy thoughts, right? So what if we thought about some happy things? What if we thought about puppies, right? Aw, right, we all love puppies, right? Look at these, think about these adorable guys, start walking. Okay, so, all right, cat people, we'll give you something else. So what if we thought about maybe your best vacation or your happiest day? And then we had participants start walking. And what we found is when you think about your happiest day or these positive emotions, the participants took bigger and faster steps. So I hope I've shared with you some days in which, share with you today, some ways in which we empower our patients to become participants in the fight to regain their mobility. And as you can see, you don't have to be a medical doctor or a healthcare professional to make a difference in the life of a patient. And that some of the best ideas are the simplest ones. A patient. I've been thinking a lot about that word patient lately. This spring, I was diagnosed with a movement disorder or central tremor. And it causes tremors in my hands. And they affect the ability to do things like button these buttons, put a thread through my daughter's sewing needle. And I thought, isn't it ironic that the guy who studies movement disorders now has one? Like, That's kind of funny. Uh, or not. And then I thought, <laughs> <laughs> then I thought, you yeah, know, this is pretty cool because I get to rely on the patients that I've worked with and the students that I've worked with who have taught me what it's like to be a participant. And so I wanna leave you with a couple additional thoughts. Many of us can remember our wedding day and for many of you in the audience and out there you'll, you'll have that day. As we learned today, some sooner than others. <laughs> and you're gonna hear a lot of things during that day you're going to blah, blah, blah. And you're kind of going to hoping to get to this point where they say, you may kiss the bride. And as you can see, I enjoyed that moment. But there's other parts of that sermon, for better or for worse, for sickness and in health. It's been written that man hath great, no greater love than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. But I disagree. There's a greater love than that. When you forsake carrying an umbrella in the pouring rain, to help your husband get to his doctor's appointment, that's a far greater love. And this image is what it gives me comfort. The love of my wife gives me comfort. And this image inspires me to help make a difference, to empower our patients to become participants. And I hope some of the things we share with you today will empower you to make a difference in the lives of those around you. Thank you.